Thank you, Carolyn. I want you to know there are a couple of mornings every year, just like clockwork, that I don't know if it's cold or allergies or whatever, but I wake up with this voice. And when you're a bass, it's great. And so I, I've decided today I'm not going to teach. I'm just going to sing Old Man River. <laughs> Old Man River. Yeah, so just kind of bear with me as I work through this today. Uh, and if you were in the first service, I need to do a little cleanup here. Well, I forgot to mention during the first service that next Sunday is Time Change Sunday. And you're going to roll your clocks forward. So uh, if you miss that, uh, you're going to get here right in the middle of the first service because you'll be late. So please make a note of that if you will. This week in the, uh, I, I read the Williamson County Sun. I know it's not as bad as the Austin American Statesman, but I still just, just like to read it once in a while and see what's going on around the area. And there were a couple of articles that uh, I don't know if they were placed together on the front page or if it was just happenstance, but uh, it was uh, keeping us up with the latest adventures of a couple of local preachers who weren't preachers anymore. One has gone on to be a justice of the peace, and another has gone on to be the head of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and, and I thought it's kind of interesting that both of those should be on the front page at the same day. And uh, as I mentioned it to Dan, he said, uh, you know what, stop and think back of who the pastors were uh, at all the larger churches in the area. There are many, many churches in the area, but the, the larger churches in the area, uh, which one is still in the pulpit? And I've been here 10 years, and the answer is zero. Not one of them other than Dan Wooldridge is, is still in his pulpit. I thought that was interesting. It wasn't surprising. Uh, I've shared with you before that when I entered the seminary, they told me that probably, 80, not probably, statistically 80% of, them, of us would be out of the ministry in 10 years. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon. But as I look back at Dan's, uh, at his career, at his ministry, I guess, that makes it all the more amazing to me that he's been preaching for over 60, uh, 40 years. Uh, now, at, I shouldn't say 60 because he's just a little over 60, yeah. But 40 years of that, he's been preaching. He's been here for, for 18 years now. And I thought, as I look back uh, with the pastors with whom I've been familiar, um, I've had served with preachers and teachers and pastors and one of the things that I see about a, a pastor, a person who is, whom God, I believe, is really called to be a pastor, uh, is not how well he preaches, uh, you know, not whether he visits, you know, not many, many, many things that people sometimes judge you by, but I really feel it's, it's, does he have a heart for the people in his congregation? And sometimes does that cost him? And as I look back at my time that I've spent with Dan, the answer is yes, he does. He has a heart for his people. It's a, it's a genuine heart for his people. He's, uh, I've come and knocked on his door a time or two, and I found him in there with his church directory open, and I thought he was just trying to remember somebody, which is why I generally open the church directory. And he's praying. He has a, a page. He'll pray over those certain people and their families uh, every day. Uh, and I'm, I'm humbled by that, and I'm, I'm honored to be serving with someone like that. And, I, and as I read the chapters today, uh, I thought of a pastor's heart because I saw what, what Paul did here. And I want to warn you about something that's coming up in, in this passage. And this is one of those crazy ones where I couldn't get a chapter to turn out just right. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at chapter 11, verse 16, through chapter 12, verse 13. So just about middle to middle. Now I want to tell you, if, if you're one of those people who is a biblical literalist, now, I don't mean inerrantist because I consider myself a biblical inerrantist, but a person who takes every word in Scripture literally, uh, you're going to have some difficulty if you don't allow room for the language because Paul's address to the church at Corinth in this part of the letter drips with sarcasm, absolutely drips with sarcasm. He's a little unhappy with them, but even in the middle of it, you'll see a tender heart as he kind of shakes his finger at them. But I want you to know there's a, a great deal of this that if you take it literally, you're going to have a problem because Paul says, I am speaking as a fool. Uh, does that mean Paul is literally saying, I'm a fool? No, it's not. But watch it in context. I begin in verse 16. I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. 
But if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. Paul walks that tightrope. And let me tell you, when I first came to know Paul, uh, I thought he was a little braggadocious at times. He said, you know, you ought to strive to be like me. But the more that I study him and the more I read him and the more I know his heart, I know I really believe there's a spirit of humility about, about Paul. And he speaks practically. And he says, okay, I don't boast in anything I do, but I'm going to boast in the Lord. I think that's okay. But here he says, okay, if I'm a fool, let me boast about myself. Meaning he'd rather not boast about himself, but if you're going to force him, why was this necessary? Do you recall the, the circumstances that led to this letter? As soon as Paul left, uh, false teachers moved in. Now, I need to tell you right now, we need to point this out. Many of them were Judaizers who were moving into the church and saying, well, you can't really become a Christian until you become a Jew, which means circumcision, uh, until you become a Jew, and then you can become a Christian. You can then convert. You know what he thought about that. He didn't like that at all. Many other false doctrines, besides which they were really uh, disrespecting, if I can take a word out of the vernacular of the 21st century, they were disrespecting Paul. They were saying, A, he wasn't a true apostle, he wasn't one of the twelve, uh, that he was doing it for money, and now they've gotten down to personal attacks and said, besides that, he's short and he's ugly. He's not impressive. He's not much of a preacher. And Paul copped to that in the last chapter. He says, well, I'm not much to look at, not much to listen to. But look what he says. I'm going to do some boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I'm not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. So he's going to tell you right now, look, this is just my opinion. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. Is he, is he complimenting them here? Thank you. You got it. He said, okay, if you're so smart, okay, you gladly put up with fools. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or take advantage of you or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. He said, that's how wise you are. You put up with these false teachers, and he's trying to describe their ministry here. They enslave them. They exploit them. Look what he says. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. He says, well, <laughs> silly me. When we got here, we didn't enslave you. We didn't exploit you. We could have done all those things since obviously you're willing to put up with it. We didn't. You know what? We just loved you. And we shared the love of Christ with you. And we shared the gospel. Would anyone else, what anyone else dares to boast about, reminder, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Now let me stop right here. He's talking to the Judaizers here particularly. Because they've said, okay, we are Jews. You know, we were God's chosen people. And, you know, we're converted to Christians now. You must become Jews also. Look what he says. Okay, they're talking about their resumes. Were they Hebrews? Yes. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Then I love the, it's parenthetical. We know there's no parentheses in the Greek, but he makes it parenthetical. He says, oh, I must be out of my mind to talk like this. And he's going on and on and telling them, look, obviously this is absurd and getting worse. But look what he says, I am more. They're Jews, fine. They say they're Israelites. They say they're Abraham's children, fine. You know what? I'm more than that. And you know what? In terms of Hebrew pedigree, was he not? He studied at the feet of Gamaliel, who was one of the premier uh, rabbis of all history, not just of that time. And he talked about a pedigree. He was as Jewish as anybody. He said, look, I've worked harder. Now he's going to go a little deeper, though. Been in prison more frequently. Been flogged more severely. And been exposed to death again and again. Now, what he's not asking is, where were they? These teachers who came in and, and took your money and, and, and spoke ill of me, you know, where were they? Did any of them get beaten up for you? And he's saying, look what, look what I did. Now, yes, was it for the cause of Christ? Absolutely. But was it on their behalf also? Did he, did he suffer ill treatment on behalf of the church and the people to whom he's writing now? Yeah, he did. Now, starting in verse 24, he's, gonna, he's already said, okay, here's some bad things that have happened. He's going to get right down and start enumerating. 
Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Now, that doesn't mean that he was just beaten five times. That means he was beaten eight times. The reason being that the 40 lashes minus one he received was a, was a punishment that was prescribed by the Jews. The three times that he was beaten with rods would have been a Roman punishment. So he said, look, not only was I beaten by the Jews, uh, and remember if you've ever studied about Jesus during the Passion time, uh, you've probably heard undoubtedly that quite often people died from those 40 lashes minus one. They were that severe. It didn't just happen to him once, folks. It happened to him five times. We don't read that completely in the, in the Scriptures, but Paul lets us know here. And he says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. He just kind of passes through that. We don't learn much about it. But if you know anything about stoning at the time, it was prescribed as capital punishment. It's not just, hey, let's all line up and throw some rocks at this guy because uh, he's received a sentence. This would have been a death sentence. We don't have the full story about how he survived that, but we do know that once he was even given the death sentence, stoned. We know that one time he was beaten and left for dead outside the city, but that apparently wasn't the time that he was stoned, but he said he was actually stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And then he says, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. Has he left anything out? Where could he go and be safe? Just about nowhere. When you stop and think, wherever he went, and one of the hallmarks, if you recall, in, the, in our study of Acts was when Paul would move from one city to another, one of the things that typically happened is he would, he would go there, he would share the gospel, uh, people would accept Christ, the church would start to grow, and then who would follow in? Generally, troublemakers from the towns that he just left, sometimes in the cover of night, sometimes being let down in a basket outside the city walls, but those people would follow him and start a riot there. So even though he might have been safe in the new city for a while, uh, his past would catch up with him and a riot would start. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. That blows my mind. He talks about the things that weigh on him, and he doesn't say that his body's probably a physical wreck for all the abuse that he's taken, about the hard things that he's had to endure. But what one thing weighs on his mind? The churches. Isn't that interesting? He, he doesn't say, you know what? There's going to come a knock at my door any minute, and they may haul me off, and this may be the last hurrah. He doesn't, he's, he's mentioned almost offhand. Well, I, you know, I was beaten five, beaten five times with uh, lashes, beaten three times with rods. I was stoned. I was shipwrecked. Yeah, you know, but you know what I really worry about? You. Now, he's, he's now comparing himself to his accusers. I don't know how many of them were beaten, how many were stoned, how many were shipwrecked, how many were hounded by, by their enemies. I think probably the answer to that is Zip. Zero. And these were the ones who were enslaving them with the law and who were taking money from them. And yet he's the one who's suffering. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? You know what he's saying? When you suffer, my brothers and sisters, I suffer with you. I hate to drag out a, a Bill Clinton quote. I really do. But he felt their pain. He really did. He absolutely did. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? In other words, he sees them and he's hurt for them. His heart aches for his church. And to me, folks, that's the mark of a pastor. That's a shepherd whose heart aches for his church. Then he says this, if I'm going to boast, he's back to his boasting. Okay, if 
I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, know that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. Not exactly a triumphal exit from the city, was it? So he's talking about his ministry and where other ministers, other pastors might be boasting about their successes. In what is he boasting? Probably not his finest moment as a pastor, being led, being dropped out of a window to escape. He says, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in my weakness. I must go on boasting. Although there's nothing to be gained, I will go to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Of whom is he speaking? Himself. Almost certainly, almost certainly. What is the third heaven? Don't know, don't know. Likely, I heard someone say paradise, likely that's it. We don't have any other description. Uh, I've heard entire sermons preached on it, none of which were satisfactory, I think, when, when supported by Scripture. But we do know that, that a third heaven is, is, a, is a special place where he's going to receive a revelation from God. And we do know that, and he's saying, okay, if I'm going to boast, you force me into this. Let me tell you what my credentials are. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I do know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. What is paradise? Uh, I've heard it said that that was actually God's presence. We know that you couldn't look upon God. Uh, but if he was brought there, he might have been given a word. But we do know that he was spiritually transformed. It was interesting that he was likely in a trance because he doesn't remember whether or not he was actually in the body or if it was during a trance or during a dream. But look what it does say. He heard inexpressible things that no man is permitted to tell. Why? Why? Nobody would understand it. Nobody would understand it. He said, I'm going to entrust you with the same knowledge, with the logos that believers are going to be entrusted with when they come into my presence. He got a preview. Look what he says. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. So he's giving him a little picture and he's kind of teasing them. He's saying, okay, who are my accusers? I've been in the, in the presence, likely, of the Almighty God. But you know what? I'm not going to boast about that. If I chose to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted than what I do or say. So he says, look, if these facts come out, I don't want me to be exalted by that. I don't want you to think any more of that than what I deserve. And I love his, I, his attitude about what do I deserve. You hear a lot about that in, in our uh, uh, 21st century society today, particularly American society. What do we deserve? Have you ever noticed in commercials that says, you're going to get these, what, blank, 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 you deserve. And that gets me to thinking, well, what do I deserve? What do you deserve? What payment do you deserve or what justice do you deserve for your sin? Sure. But we get life. Isn't that amazing? To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. I just sometimes think that perhaps more theological ink has been spilled over that one subject than any other in all of Scripture. What was the thorn in Paul's flesh? I don't know how far we can narrow it. Uh, I do know one thorn that apparently he did have, and I don't know if this is the one of which he speaks, but it appeared to have been his eyesight. He used an amanuensis 
almost always, which is a secretary, which is not at all unusual in that day and time. But quite often, he says, look, I have written this in my own hand. In other words, I will authenticate it. The amanuensis might have written it. You know, I, I dictated it to him, but I'm going to write something in my own hand so that you'll see it's genuine. And then he said, you know, look how large I wrote. There are other clues in Scripture that indicate that perhaps his eyesight wasn't very good. And perhaps it could have been that that was his thorn in the flesh, that he said, uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, he could have just gone down to Pearl Optical and gotten some bifocals. You know, you stop and th I stop and think that if uh, my vision, for example, uh, back in those days, I would have been doing a lot of squinting. You know, I'm not helpless. I can get by without my glasses. But, you know, reading's a little difficult. No bifocals for Paul. And so what he had to deal with could have been very difficult. And three times, he says, I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. That's kind of interesting that he mentioned that number, uh, because I know that many times he must have said, oh, rats, I wish I could see that, or why couldn't I see better? But specifically, three times he went to the Lord and he said, Lord, I'm doing my best here, and I want to do what you want me to do. Could you please take this thorn from me? Could you please take this, this eyesight problem, whatever it was, could you please take it away from me so that I could be even more effective in what I'm doing? And what did the Lord say? He said to me, and is, in that, is this in red in your Bible? So this is Jesus. He's gone, to Je he's gone to the Lord, and he said, look, can you help me out here? And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That's a concept that is, that is just threaded throughout Scripture. Uh, Jesus mentioned it time and time again. Paul talks about strength through weakness, and we just don't get it. Why? What do we want to be? Strong. We want to come to, we want to, come to the Lord in our strength. It's just the opposite of what he wants. And I don't know about you, but I found that, that more often he uses me in my weakness than he does in my strength. I, I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to kind of flesh it out here. Um, preaching is an odd thing. It works on your head. It, it really does. It, it works on your head. And if you are in tune, I'm amazed at how God can provide for you the material that he wants you to use and the way he wants you to deliver it. And sometimes he'll change it while you're in the middle of it. It's amazing to me how he does that. But what I found is that when, when I do it in my strength, it's almost never effective. I have come in what I thought was ill-prepared because I'm a preparation nut. I mean, I've got to be studied up weeks ahead of time, and I'm ready. And I've come in what I thought was ill-prepared because God messed with me and changed it around at the last time. And okay, God, but I'm just not going to be as ready as I ought to be. And stumbled through it, and I got my mix all talked up, you know. Uh, and I, I just didn't get it delivered right. And I, yeah, okay, God, there it is. You know, that's what you asked for. And have people tell me, you know, I need a recording of that. I need to share that with somebody. That really touched my life. And I'm thinking, wasn't me wasn't me and that's the point point. and so I kind of get tickled when people think about ministry and what God calls them to do and and think well I can't do that I'm not qualified for that okay Moses <laughs> oh who am I Lord that you should send me you know, I'm hiding here on the back of the wilderness. And besides that, I don't speak too well. You know, the whole litany of, of Moses' excuses that he threw out there? And I thought, aren't we just the same? But look what he said. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. What are his weaknesses? Not a very good speaker. He's short and ugly. Not very impressive. I'll boast about those things. So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, 
I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And I've got to confess to you that I'm not to the point now where I can be in the midst of a persecution or in the midst of, of sickness or illness and say, thank you, Lord, that I'm perfected through this. I'm just not quite there yet. And I look at Paul and I'm amazed. I don't believe he just said it. I believe he did it. I've made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, okay, some of these things sounded braggadocious. I know, it, you know it's foolish, but you know what? How did they make him do it? They've come to him and said, well, look what these other teachers said. He said, okay, if you're going to make me do it, let me tell you. I ought, I ought to have been commended by you, for I'm not in the least inferior to the super apostles, even though I'm nothing. Look what he's done. He said, okay, I'm nothing. I boast in my weakness. I'm not much to look at. I'm not much to listen to. You know what? But I am powerful through Christ in my weakness. And he, used, he said, I may not be much, but I'm more than these super apostles.